form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. At this time we will have a prayer by Dr. Daniel Anwar. Our scripture for the, tonight is Jeremiah, the 29th chapter to be read by our dean, Dr. Terry Walsh. I will be doing the announcements at the end of class. We will have a couple selections from the choir, and our readers for tonight will be the participation of the class. Good evening, class. Let us all bar our hearts and minds. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father Yahweh, I come to you through your Son, Yahshua the Messiah, and I ask that you enlighten the speakers, illuminate their souls and their hearts to preach your gospel in wisdom, intelligence, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, strength, and that we also, as the hearers, are able to receive the information and utilize it. With all these blessings, I ask in your son's name, hallelujah. Well, good evening. I'll be reading the 29th chapter of Jeremiah from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, as revised by the late A.B. Trana and revised again by Yahshua Promotions of Ronsevert, West Virginia. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from, Bab from Jerusalem to Babylon, after that Jeconiah the king, and the queen, and the eunuchs, and princes of Judah and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. By the hand of Elasa the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, 
unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto Yahweh for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith Yahweh. For thus saith Yahweh, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith Yahweh, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith Yahweh, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith Yahweh. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive, because ye have said, Yahweh hath raised us up prophets in Babylon. Know that thus saith Yahweh of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David, and of all the people that dwelleth in this city, and of your brethren that are not gone forth with you into captivity. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, and with the famine, and with the pestilence, and will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them. Because they have not hearkened to my word, saith Yahweh, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them. But ye would not hear, saith Yahweh. Hear ye therefore the word of Yahweh, all ye of the captivity whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, of Ahab the king of Koleiah, and of Zedekiah the son of Maaseiah, which prophesy a lie unto you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of Judah, which are in Babylon, saying, Yahweh make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they have committed villainy in Israel, and have committed adultery with their neighbors' wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them, even I, even I know and am a witness, saith Yahweh. Thus shalt thou also speak to Shemaiah the Nehelamite, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, saying, Because thou hast sent letters in thy name unto all the people that are at Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah the son of Maaseiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, Yahweh hath made thee priest in the stead of Jehoiada the priest, that ye should be officers in the house of Yahweh for every man that is mad and maketh himself a prophet, that thou shouldest put him in prison and in the stocks. Now therefore, why hast thou not included Jeremiah of Anathoth, which maketh himself a prophet to you? For therefore he sent unto us in Babylon, saying, This captivity is long. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. And Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the ears of Jeremiah the prophet. Then came the word of Yahweh unto Jeremiah, saying, Send to all them of the captivity, saying, Thus saith Yahweh concerning Shemaiah the Nehalamite, Because that Shemaiah hath prophesied unto you, and I sent him not, and he caused you to trust in a lie, therefore thus saith Yahweh, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nehalamite, 
and his seed, and he shall not have a man to dwell among this people, neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, saith Yahweh, because he hath taught rebellion against Yahweh. That's the 29th chapter of Jeremiah from the Holy Name Bible. At this time, I would like to remind everyone to please quiet all cell phones and electronic devices so that class is not disturbed. Choir.
first cause of creation The lamb slain from the lamb slain from the lamb slain from the foundation of the world Alpha and Omega Almighty Creator Yeah First cause of creation The lamb slain from the Search for him while he is near, while he can be found. If you really feared, you would search for him. He's everywhere. Yahweh can be found while there's still time. the time to spare and teardrops are your only reason for even wondering if he exists just who he is won't take that step to learn his name you're gonna be to blame if you don't search for him while he is can be found if you really feared you would search for him he's everywhere Yahweh can be found while there's still time to care oh he does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor dwell among the sun and moon and stars. He has a divine purpose you need to understand. Come learn of it and learn just who you
Thank you, choir. <coughs> Excuse me. Our first speaker for this evening will be Dr. Graciela Underwood. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to just kind of practice doing something that I've been wanting to do. So bear with me. Uh, okay. Good evening. This is school. So I'm going to come over here to the chart that has the enlarged version of the tabernacle pattern, which uh, we've come to understand through this divine vision and revelation that. Uh, Moses was shown uh, how to build this tabernacle pattern. Therefore, it's been given to us to come to know that this pattern shows us something with regard to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua, he being one spirit, three manifestations, I mean, three states of existence, two manifestations. And that this tabernacle pattern the dimensions are, are given in the Bible and that we know that from the back of the uh, tabernacle to the front is 150 feet and that this um, most holy place was 15 by 15 and then the holy place was 30 by 15 and then from the door to the gate was 70 feet and that with the high priest standing here at the door being that one foot so to speak that it would be 69 feet and that you could take and divide equally in order to show where the, the um, altar of sin sacrifice and labor are located, that, that basically this would be like at, um, taking the center aspect of it. This would be at 23 feet and then this would be at the next 23 feet, which would be like 46 feet. And then you'd get to the 69 where the priest was. Dr. Kinley has shown us that there are seven steps to this tabernacle pattern, the first step being the gate, the second step being this altar of sin sacrifice, the third step being this labor, the fourth step being the door, the fifth step being the holy place, the sixth step being that dividing veil, which is referred to as the second veil, that's between the most holy place and the holy place, and then the seventh step being the most holy place. Now, uh, when I was first introduced to this teaching, the very first class that I came to, they went through and um, showed about how physically water baptizing yourself was not salvation for your soul. And I did leave that class realizing that I did not have to physically water baptize the child that I was contemplating having to do that. I didn't have to do that. So I didn't do that. I didn't really understand about the name of our Heavenly Father being Yahweh or that his divine title was Elohim or that there's only one name for salvation and that name being Yash Messiah. I didn't understand that from that first meeting. The uh, thing that I was thinking was that I was thinking that, well, that was nice. I did my friend a favor and, well, I probably won't be back there again. As a matter of fact, I even wrote that to one of my sisters. But uh, mm -hmm. Yahweh, our Elohim, he is merciful. And thankfully, his thoughts... <laughs> are much greater than mine. And he saw fit to have me brought back to another meeting. And the secondary meeting that I went to happened to be uh, what's referred to as a special lecture, which was held in a different city. So um, I was basically having to be there for the entire time. And at that particular meeting, uh, there was one of the ministers who he went through something that showed me that there was proof in the Bible, and there was also aspects of this tabernacle that they correlated to show forth that there was some truth to what this divine vision and revelation was explaining. And that I couldn't just dismiss this divine vision and revelation as being, you know, that's just another religion. That this was something direct from Yahweh. And that's basically what the founder of this school has set out to show, is that Yahweh sent him. Now, as it was stated in the um, 
scripture reading, um, which if we'll go ahead and get Jeremiah, the, uh, let me find my Jeremiah part. Yeah, because I'm going to get you, I'm going to actually get several parts in Jeremiah. I want you to go back to, if I, Okay, this, there are several chapters in Jeremiah where Yahweh has basically said that they were going to go into captivity to Babylon. But then there's prophets that are saying that they're not going to go into captivity to Babylon. So I'm going to go ahead and have you read where Yahweh is having one of his prophets um, tell them that they are going to go into captivity. And I want you to start at 27 and 6. And uh, go on down to 9. Jeremiah 27 and 6. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field have, not, have I given him also to serve him. And all the nations shall, ser shall serve him, and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And it shall come to pass that the nation and kingdom, which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith Yahweh. So you hear that. He's going to punish those who don't put their yoke under that Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar is, is basically, he's, he's doing what, oh, believe it or not, because of, of what he's going to do, he's doing what is according to the, to the divine purpose of Yahweh. Go ahead. Um... Mm -hmm. With the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. Therefore, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon. So he's warning them not to listen to those people who says you won't be doing this because he says you're going to, then you're going to. Okay, so go ahead and go again to 14th, 27 and 14. Therefore, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. And then go to 28 and 15, and go down to 17. 28 and 15? Mm-hmm. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, Yahweh had not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore thus saith Yahweh, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against Yahweh. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh, seventh month. The people were warned not to listen to prophets who were saying that, oh, this won't happen to you, okay? Which is basically a familiar lie, <laughs> if you know anything about what's been going on. Anyways, but, so now, one of those prophets who said, this won't happen to you, he had to die because he was not a prophet sent by Yahweh, okay? So then go to um, Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, and... Start at 8 and go through 9. For thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith Yahweh. See, they could still come in his name, but they may not be talking about what thus saith Yahweh. Okay, so it's important to know the difference. Now, uh, go to 13. And ye shall see me. Wait, start me. at 12. 12. And then shall ye call upon me, 
and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall, find, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith Yahweh, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith Yahweh. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Because ye okay, have... Stop. Uh, okay, now go to 19. Now... Yahweh is letting them know that they're going to be in captivity, but they're only going to be in captivity for a set time, and he's going to gather them back unto himself, okay? Now, let's go to 19. Because they have not hearkened to my words, saith Yahweh, which I sent unto them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. But ye would not hear, saith Yahweh. Hear ye therefore the word of Yahweh, all ye of the captivity, whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Mm -hmm. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, of Ahab the son of Kolaiah, and of Zedekiah the son of which prophesy a lie unto you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and ye shall slay them before and he your shall slay and them. he shall slay them before your eyes. And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of Judah, which are in Babylon, saying, Yahweh, make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Because they have committed villainy in Israel, and have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Even I know, and am a witness, saith Yahweh. Now, I wanted to have that read because, you know, he knows everything. So he knows, you know, he knows who he sent and who he hasn't sent. So going back to, I'm in this meeting, my second time coming to a meeting held by the IDMR, I'm in a strange city, and I'm listening to this minister. And he's going in, and he's doing something, and he's using numbers. Now, at, you know, it took me a while to realize later what it was that he was doing. And, and that's kind of why I'm, I'm going to go ahead and kind of do this exercise now, which is basically he was showing me that there's proof to show whether or not Thus saith Yahweh, whether something comes from him or not. And this, this divine vision and revelation has given us the key, which is this tabernacle pattern, to show us that if, it's, if it be of Yahweh, then it's going to show forth Yahshua the Messiah. It's going to show forth his death, his burial, his resurrection. It's going to go according to this tabernacle pattern. And it's going to always point to the fact that Yahweh is our Elham and he is our Savior. So going according to that, now I'm going to, well, okay, let me do it this way. I told you about the 150 feet. I told you about the fact that from the gate to the uh, center of this altar is about, tw is about 23. It's actually 23 and a third, but it's about 23 feet. And then from here to here would be about 46 feet. Now I'm telling you that information, that fact right now, because I'm going to be using that information, and I do want to have someone bring that, that board over here for a moment. I also told you about the steps about the first step being the gate, the second step being this altar, and the third step being the labor. I want you to bear in mind about those 46 and about this third step because I'm going to be using that information also. Now I'm walking over here to what we refer to as the ages and dispensations chart. Because I have found out by attending these classes that time is a creation. Mm -hmm. yep. And that it abides <laughs> within eternity. Yep. That, you know... And what we have here is we have on this chart this orangey, fiery cloud symbolizing eternity. And the creation abides within Yahweh or eternity. So when he began the, the creation, it was in timelessness, that being that first age. Then you have what's referred to as the Garden of Eden, where with the transgression, that's when time began. So looking at from the time that time began, and to the end of this second age, 
which is the antediluvian age, the end of that age occurred with Noah and the flood. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show that, and this, and well, let me go here. Each age is, a, is pr approximately 2,000 years, but this happens to be a short age. And we know the age having t being actually 1,656 years from Adam, you know, the fall of Adam, unto the flood being 1,656 years. Now, this can be proven using your Bible, but also verified by the fact that it's ordained here according to the, what's set forth in this tabernacle pattern. And when that minister went through those things, at the time, I didn't realize what it was he was showing me. I just knew that I suddenly had a sinking feeling, oh my goodness, I cannot easily dismiss this. I'm going to have to investigate this teaching further. And since then, I have been coming back on what I would say a continual basis, for it is now, have, now has been over, uh, well, it's been about 33 years since I've been coming to these classes. And it's not so much how much you learn regarding facts or knowledge, it's whether you understand what it is that you're being shown, and that is that you're being shown that Yahweh our Elohim, he is real and he is salvation for your soul. That's what's really the essence of this whole divine vision and revelation that has been given in our age. So I'm hopefully giving you something that will help you to at least want to investigate this on your own and to look at this and realize that he's here and he's salvation and that you know, he's with you and that you rec if you recognize him as being your savior, then you too have a chance for eternal life you know, when Yashna Messiah, the Holy Spirit, resideth with you. So, uh, reader, if you would go ahead and go to Genesis, and actually I'd like to have the board brought up just a little bit closer to where I'm at. Thank you. I'm going to put this down. I don't think I need this right now. Now, this is the number that we're dealing with right now as far as the year of the flood. Now, now, let's go with this. Is that not going to work? Go with the black. Okay, we will go with the black. I'm writing the word tabernacle because I've given you some facts regarding the tabernacle. I said that we would be working with the 46 feet. And I told you about the third step. Now, these dimensions of the tabernacle were actually given in cubics. So if you're going to look for the, uh, some of those, you'd actually be seeing cubics. But a cubic is basically the same as a foot and a half. And so 46 is what it would be from from the gate to the altar, the labor, excuse me, the labor, okay? And if you were to multiply these, these numbers, you'd get a figure. But right now, we also want you to know that you're going to have to convert this or include inches to get what we're looking at. But first, we'll go ahead and start with this multiplication, which is 3 times 6 is 18, carry my 1 plus 3 times 4 plus the 1 is going to be 138, correct? And then you're going to do 12 for the inches, okay? 
So two times eight is 16, carry my one. Two times three plus the one is gonna be seven. Two times two is two. Eight. <laughs> three, one. So now we're gonna get six, five, carry my one, six, five. So you see that I have reached this one, six, five, six by showing you this aspect about the tabernacle, okay? Now we're gonna go ahead and get those numbers out of the Bible to show you that it's in the Bible. And we want the reader, I'm gonna go on this other side here, hopefully this can still be okay. The reader is gonna to go to Genesis, the third chapter. Oops, no, not three, excuse me, I skipped the page. Genesis, I'm working with flip. Genesis, the fifth chapter. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna read the third verse. And I'm gonna write numbers down. I'm writing 130. Genesis five and three. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Okay, now I'm going to ask him to go, okay, so this is, for now, we're just write down Adam for now. Go to verse 6, and I'm going to write down 105. Verse 6, and Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Okay, now... Okay, and now go down to nine. And Enos lived 90 years and begot Canaan. So now we got him. We're gonna go ahead and just use initials for now. Now go to 12. 12. And Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalaleel. Mm -hmm. Now go to 15. And Mahalil lived 60 and five years and begat Jared. Mm -hmm. You notice I'm writing a little smaller because there's going to be quite a few numbers here. And now go to 18. And Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. Mm -hmm. That's Jared who begat Enoch. And Enoch lived 60 and five years. And and begot, tell us where you're at. People want to know. Um, 21. Mm -hmm. uh, in, Enoch lived 60 and five years and begot Methuselah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 24. Uh, oh, 25. 25. Mm -hmm. And Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begot Lamech. Okay, 28. And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and, our, and toil of our hands because of the ground which Yahweh hath cursed. Now go to Genesis, the seventh chapter, 11th verse. 7 and 11, you said? Mm-hmm. 7 and 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, if we've got all our numbers, which for a moment here, hand me that. Hundred and thirty, hundred hundred and five, ninety, seventy, sixty-five, one sixty-two, sixty-five, one eighty-seven, one eighty-two. Then the six hundred, okay, which we got from Genesis seven and eleven. When you add those all up, regardless of what the marker's doing, you're going to get one six five six. You're going to get that same number, the year of the flood. Now, 
This blew me away. Thank you. 
You also show forth that death, that burial, because remember we said the sacrifice had to be buried, okay? And then, we already knew it was killed, so dead, buried. And then the high priest, he would resurrect from this court roundabout into the holy place, and he would perform the functions therein. In this holy place, you had vessels also. The vessels that were in the holy place, in the most holy place, were different in that these down here were, was a brazen altar, sin sacrifice, and a brazen labor, okay? I won't go into what this is, but I will say this much. With regard to here in the holy place, this was a seven-branch golden lampstand. This was a golden table of shoe bread with, a, with a two, uh, two crowns on it here. And this was, you know, also a golden structure in that even if it was made with shittim wood, it was covered with gold, okay? So you have here, this was a five-sided structure, and there were horns also on this uh, altar, and that this is indeed where they kept those garments of beauty and glory. Now, um, when you went into the most holy place, there was also a vessel here. This was a three-in-one configuration in that you had the two archangels with their wings almost touching, and they're not looking at one another, okay? then this structure was such that, um, as it was described to me, it would be kind of like what a hope chest, where it would open up. And inside, there were certain things that were, that were eventually placed in there. You have, as is shown here, those tables of stone where then the law was written. You had the golden pot of manna, and you had Aaron's rod that budded. Those, for sure, I know, were in here, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, you've got a, a three and one here, you've got three vessels here, and then you've got the three vessels here. Now these nine vessels, they're showing forth that Yahweh, our Elohim, he has nine major divine attributes, okay? But he didn't stop there with regard to giving us witnesses regarding himself. He's also made it possible for us to understand that man is made in the image of Elohim by this pattern of the tabernacle. And we'll go over here to the green chart for a moment just to show you about those nine um, major systems in man. The nervous system, the reproductive, the endocrine, 
the respiratory, the circulatory, the excretory, the digestive, the muscular, and the skeletal. Okay. Now coming back here, okay, now you've also got the fact that this uh, tabernacle can be uh, correlated with man's body, but what we're going to do at this point, if the reader will bear with me, um, I'm going to come over here for a moment and ask for some papers that I have, excuse me, and some water. <laughs> Give me the water, will you please? Thanks. This is found in Elohim textbook, volume one, page 126 through 127. Because remember, I told you about the seven steps. Now, I want the reader to go ahead and re start reading on page 126 at the beginning, on the top of that. It should be. Page 126, the Yellow Hymn Book, Volume 1, mm -hmm. the number seven. There are seven steps, dimensions or planes, often referred to as heavens, whereas there, there are but three heavens. Now, if you were listening carefully, there are people in the world that think that there's seven heavens. There's not. Okay? There's only three. Now, one, two, three. Okay, continue. Second uh, Corinthians 12, 1 through 4, mm -hmm. which leads to perfection. The seven steps, dimensions, or planes are revealed in the pattern of the tabernacle and in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, the universe called the migratory pattern. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt you. So there, um, letting you know that there are seven steps and that this tabernacle can also be, I'm moving over here to the, what we refer to as the Moses chart, and right here in the center of this Moses chart, this would be referred to, I'll put it plainly, as the migratory pattern. And just as we had, pointing over here to this again, a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout, you can see that happening with this migratory pattern in that the children of Israel were here in the dark land of Egypt, that being likened unto that uh, court roundabout. Then they were brought through a veil, that being like this Red Sea, into the wilderness of Sinai, that being likened unto the holy place. And then they also, those that, those that were uh, born here, in the wilderness of Sinai, they went through another veil, this, like, this Jordan River being likened unto that veil, to reach the promised land of Canaan's land, which is likened unto the most holy place. So you've got that migratory pattern. Most holy place, Canaan's land, okay, the veil, the river Jordan, the wilderness of Sinai, the holy place, that veil, the Red Sea, and then Egypt, okay, like the court roundabout. So we're basically showing you most holy place, second veil, holy place, first veil, court roundabout. That's what we're showing you here and here. And Dr. Kinley is talking about that on those pages. Now, Yahshua fulfills these things. So when you have, and I'm going to, let's see, what direction do I want to go in here? Okay. Oh, I guess I'm coming right back here again. <laughs> okay, so the gate, the entrance into the tabernacle. Now, he gives scriptural references for all of this, but I'm not going to go into all of that at this point. Okay, but they are, like I said, found on page 126 through 127 of volume 1. And perhaps in some future date, we will go into that. Then for the migratory pattern, he also gives scripture. By the door entrance into the houses of the Israelites on which the blood of the lamb was put on the lentil and two side posts. That would be the same as referring to this gate. Okay? And this is fulfilled by Yahshua when he said, enter in at the straight gate. And he gives the reference of Matthew 7.13. Now, this second step, okay, which we have um, identified as that altar of sin for sacrifice, 
in the um, court roundabout, in the migratory pattern, he refers to that as, the, as being by the slaying and eating of the Paschal lamb in preparation to leave out of Egypt, and that that was fulfilled by the prepared body of Yahshua, the Passover lamb, slain for the sins of the world. Now, the third step that brazen labor in the court, which, as I said, was for washing and cleansing purposes, in the migratory pattern, he refers to that being by the baptism of the Israelites in the cloud and in the sea as they fled from the Egyptians. And that that was fulfilled by Yahshua by washing the disciples' feet. Okay, and he refers to John 13, 4 through 5 for that. Now the fourth step, that first veil or the door of the tabernacle, in the migratory pattern, is referred to as being by the parting, okay, because now you've got a door. Before they didn't have a way, now they've got a way. By the parting of the waters of the Red Sea, forming an entrance into the wilderness of Sinai. And that that was fulfilled by Yahshua, who said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. Okay? Now the fifth step, okay, being the sanctuary or the tabernacle with its furniture for its ceremonial purpose overlaid with gold, and we told you about that. Here with the wilderness, by the wilderness of Sinai, where, the Israel, where Israel received the law and the tabernacle with its ceremonies, with the presence of Elohim among them. He says, it was fulfilled by Yahshua, who said, I am the light of the world, the bread of life, and the intercessor. Now, coming back here, you can see plainly that, he, that Yahshua is fulfilling according to this tabernacle pattern, and that he's the light of the world. Okay? So him being that, like that fourth prong where that oil was poured into, and then uh, that before him and that after him, he's... he's dying for all the sins of the world, okay? Now, he says he's that bread of life. The children of Israel, they had to um, offer up, you know, that uh, 12 loaves of shoe, of shoe bread, one for each tribe, and they were, it was set here on this, on this table. Well, he's the true bread of life. In the wilderness of Sinai, when the children of Israel were hungry, Yahweh rained down manna for them, and they said, what is this? It was like a bread from heaven. And Yahshua is that true bread. Okay? So, and then here, this altar uh, of, um, of incense, uh, incense. This is where they, they did the prayers and there was an intercession between man and Yahweh. Okay? So now, the true intercessor is Yahshua the Messiah. He's the one who, as the Holy Spirit, he's continually intercessing for us before the Father. Okay? So then going back to, let's see here, um, the sixth step, that dividing veil between the most holy place and the holy place, okay, over here, as I said, is by that parting of the River Jordan forming the second veil between the wilderness of Sinai and Canaan's land. And that was fulfilled by Yahshua Messiah when he took off the veil of the flesh, and ascended into heaven. Now, this is important. Not everyone in the world realizes, those who believe, quote-unquote, in Jesus Christ as a Savior, there are those who don't recognize the fact that he took off the flesh. He is not coming back in a physical body. You're not going to see your loved ones in physical bodies in the world to come. In the new earth and the new heaven, it's not going to be physical. And that's important to recognize that. So, as I said, okay, that sixth step was fulfilled by Yahshua the Messiah when he took off the veil of his flesh and ascended into heaven. Uh, let's get Hebrews 10 and 20. We should basically just say that. Hebrews 10 and 20. Mm -hmm. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now the seventh step, which is that most holy place, okay, where on the Day of Atonement, 
that's where Yahweh Elohim would appear. And it's referred to as that uh, Shekinah or Shekinai. And then the children of Israel, their sins were forgiven at his appearance there. Okay. And that was based on obedience because, you know, everything had to be done accordingly as he had stated. So that most holy place, the Israelites entering in to Canaan or the promised land, their final earthly inheritance, that's a type. That's a type of heaven. It's fulfilled by Yahshua Messiah who entered not into the holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself. Not a physical heaven, mind you, but into heaven itself. Let's get Hebrews 6, 19 through 20, please. And thank you for bearing with us. We only have one reader tonight. Hebrews 6 and 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Through 20? Oh, 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Yahshua made a high priest forever mm -hmm. after the order of Melchizedek. Because he's the high priest of high priests, okay? And then nine, uh, Hebrews 9 and 24. 9 and 24. For the Messiah is not entered into, into the holy places made with hands, mm -hmm. which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself, now, appear, now to appear in the presence of Yahweh for us. So he's appearing in the presence of Yahweh for us. Now, that's another reason why we say in this school, our first aim is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. It's so important. Okay? Now, as I said, Yahweh has three states of existence but it's one spirit that has been operating. This chart is on the pattern or plan of salvation, and that is why he is operating and doing the things he's doing according to this tabernacle pattern for the purpose of salvation. Here Yahweh in his pure spirit state, there is no way, none, that man with his finite brain, mind, thinking, finite, mind you, there's no way that he's going to be able to conjure, meditate, come upon, in any way, know him. None. In this state, when he, okay, takes on this superincorporeal being, embodiment, the spiritual embodiment of these, you know, with, and it didn't take all of him to do this. So when he's here in this state, it's still him. Those nine major divine attributes, it's all there. It's still him in this state. But he's here in this day for an express purpose. Just like we were reading in Jeremiah. He's giving what it is that he wants his people to know. He appeared unto Moses and he wanted, them, he wanted him to know things. You know? And this is... this. It's part of what he wanted him to know. He told the prophets what he wanted the people, what he wanted the people to know. Thus, tell the people, thus saith Yahweh. Don't tell them you said this. Tell them what I say. Don't tell them what you're thinking. Tell them what I say. It was very important that they speak according to what he said when he appeared unto them. And then he came in another state of existence. Now, the real mystery and this came, I don't know what class I had, had attended when I was first heard this. And it's, it's not something that I'm going to go into at this point. But someone else will, I'm sure. And that here we're seeing him come as Yahshua the Messiah to fulfill that which was written of him in the law and in the testimony. The law being the first five books and the testimony being those next 34 of the Bible. But he had also come back here during the time of Moses. And that was the great mystery, that he was back here during the time of Moses. 
But when he came here back during the time of Moses, it wasn't to fulfill. It is when he comes here and he physically sheds his blood and has completed the will of the Father, done everything that the Father has determined is to be done and has physically shed his blood so that he is that Lamb of Yahweh, sacrificed. That's what's important mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. and to recognize, that he is that sacrifice, the only sacrifice that is acceptable to Yahweh, our Elohim. So whether he's in this state, this state, or in this state, it is Yahweh, because Yahshua means Yahweh is salvation. Right. Yahweh said there is no other Savior besides him. He's the one that ultimately is doing the work. And when you come to know and understand that it's Yahshua the Messiah, and you believe that it's him, that Holy Spirit in you is going to be intercessing for you with the Father. And you'll be able to praise him and do that which Yahshua determines. Because you'll start to, you can't, you'll have the I can't help it, basically. In the sense that you will be praising Yahshua and giving praises to Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. in everything that you do. And be thankful, thankful that you were given a chance, invited, right. invited by whoever it is that invited you, by ever mean, whatever means that were given to you to, to attend this school, to listen to these lectures. And it says, you know, why did, it said about that wide gate, okay? That wide gate, 30 feet here. But when it came to this door, it was only three feet. You know, many entered therein, you know? So many are called, but few are chosen. And then even of those that are chosen, Remember, Judas Iscariot, he was chosen, but he was not faithful. He was not faithful. So it also requires obedience and faithfulness. So endure, learn all you can because you're going to need it, and be thankful. Just be thankful that, you know, he has mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. Our next speaker for this evening will be the secretary of the school, Dr. Janice Welsh. Well, good evening, class. And I truly enjoyed the words of the previous speaker. And, you know, she was going through the thing about um, the tabernacle, which in the moderation it says absolutely nothing escapes this tabernacle pattern. We may not be able to figure it out or put it together, but when you talk about how the flood happened and, you, and, you know, she put all the numbers out, um, and showed how that 1656 was the year of the flood back here with Noah, <clears throat> and how you can take that tabernacle pattern and show that. Now, when she came into class, I still remember, I believe it was 1980, because I subtracted 33 years. Uh, that would have been the year that I was great with child. I don't know if it was <laughs> when you came. It was three of us in class. We were all expecting kids. And uh, so the, 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 she didn't really know this, but her, she had this dilemma in her mind that her child was he to be baptized or not to be baptized. Um, but little did she know that Yahweh had prepared her for her to come into that class that night because we had a minister's meeting and I remember it clearly because somebody decided 
that we were going to go in our minister's meeting and talk about baptism. Mm -hmm. So we spent, I don't know how much time, and we didn't know you were coming. We, we had no clue. We didn't know what was on your mind when you came. But um, we went through baptism, and <clears throat> I had only been in class, I think, maybe three or four years at that time. So I, I felt real, real new. Um, and so we took the time in our class to go over baptism in the law, in the prophecy, in the fulfillment, and to show how that the children of Israel, um, how Yahshua set that up back there with the children of Israel, and how they went through the divided waters of the Red Sea, but they did not get wet. So even though she didn't know it, and usually when somebody comes to class for the first time, we usually take time to explain the name of, of Yahshua and Yahweh and why that's important. But when she came to class, I mean, it was covered in the moderation, but um, we went over baptism and had no idea that that was, was on her mind. I didn't find out till years later. And her little boy was about two years old and he was, you know, running around the room, having a good old time. And it's funny when you look back and see how Yahweh has everything preordained and sometimes he lets you get a clue that he is the one that's in charge <laughs> so <laughs> no matter what's going on or how bad you think your life is Yahweh's already pre-planned it so once you kind of get that understood you can still fret you know I still fret sometimes but sometimes you have to calm down and say okay he has it all planned out. And I think it's in the, in the um, vision pamphlet where it says he's planned out the meanderings and the imagination. What, what is it? Shoot, yeah, we might want to get that. Um, <clears throat> about the baptism. So I'm pretty sure it was a relief at that point to know that you don't have to baptize your little baby. I mean, Dunk him in water. He's two years old. <laughs> I'm sure you. <laughs> I was terrified at 12, so I can't imagine how it would have been at that age for a child to have to um, get dunked in water. So when you look back here, and it all still is going according to this tabernacle pattern, first you come to this altar. Like she said, wide is the gate. You know, everybody brought their little sacrifices here to be offered up because everybody was sinning, doing something. Um, so they had to bring a sacrifice to be killed here at the offered, uh, altar of sin sacrifice. But after that, um, you see here that's the laver. And I believe that's the third step in the tabernacle. So if you look over here at the tabernacle, like she was going through those, those numbers, <clears throat> it's the third step and it's water. And here you have the laver, which is a circular configuration. So if you look at it, it looks like 30 if you put them together. Doesn't, you don't have to stretch your imagination all out of whack just to come up with 30. It's a, it's a laver, it's a circle, and there's a, it's the third step. So there's a principle of three anyway. There's a principle of a three, and the zero is just a placeholder. So when you look at Yahshua the Messiah, and it says here, A.D. 30, that's when he came to be baptized. Mm -hmm. So the things in the tabernacle pattern are lining up with the Savior and what he did and what, you know, what he came in to fulfill on the earth. Um, I want you to look up fulfill in the, in the dictionary and um, get me... I think it's John, is it 5 and um, where it says, think not that, I, or that he comes to fulfill. Do you know where the, what scripture that is? It's one we get all the time. <laughs> Matthew, 5, Matthew 5 and 17, yeah. <laughs> so we'll get that one too. <clears throat> and, um, and it was funny, I was just here on the floor talking about baptism and it's funny how she just picked up and started talking about the whole world being baptized with the flood. 
So I'm going to run over here to this scripture too, or this chart, and you can see how in Adam all die. There's a there's a principle that's going on, and it's going on over and over again. In Adam all die. So there's a death, just like when you look at this tabernacle when you had to bring the sacrifices. What happened? What was it? There was a death, and there was. Four points of blood here on this altar where the high priest had to put the blood of the sacrifice. And just so happens that with Adam, when he died, his blood went to what? The four corners of the earth. Now, why do they call it the four corners? I mean, I would have. Yeah, in fact, even if it was, well, they thought it was flat. <laughs> but the four corners of the earth, that's where the blood went to. And it, and it, absolutely nothing escapes this pattern. Um, so you had this death back here with Adam. And then you had the flood, as she was talking about, with Noah. And this wasn't just a little flood. Like I saw on TV, they were talking about the floods in Colorado, where it completely destroyed people's homes. But there was some land and stuff that you could see. We're talking about a flood that completely covered or inundated the earth it was it was the end of the world mm -hmm. it really was and it also reminds me of that uh, that movie <laughs> where it was supposed to be oh what was the name of that doggone movie <laughs> it was good too see your memory trying to kind of goes um it was the one where they built the arcs yeah. And you had to pay millions. You know, only the billionaires got to get on the doggone thing. 2012. 2012. Yeah, and that's already passed. Thank you. It was 2012. Well, back here in whatever. The, <laughs> what year was that? That it was the 600th year of Noah's life that the flood came. It, it's, it's 1656. Uh, that would have been a movie <laughs> here of, the, of this flood. It was a... There was no way for anybody to survive that flood. There would have had to been divine specifications from the creator himself. They wouldn't have been making these little art things that they made and only the billionaires got to get on there. This was something that Yahweh just found grace. Okay, Noah, he found grace in Yahweh's sight and he made a way for him to escape the impending doom that was about to take place on the earth. And it was doom. Nobody could have survived that flood. It was what they call catastrophic. That's for those people who like big words. It was devastating. It completely destroyed everything on the earth. That to me is unimaginable. I couldn't even imagine being in the ark when all that was taking place because it seemed to me like they would have really got tossed to and fro. Um, that ark had to be made in such a way for even the people that were inside of it to be able to survive. You're talking about the fountains of the deep blowing up, the biggest geyser you ever saw, and then water coming down from above and just smashing. Your little Fido puppy that you just love, he wouldn't have made it, your baby, no granny, nobody. Nobody could have survived it without divine intervention. So when you look at how she put together those numbers to show you what year it was gonna happen, in the tabernacle, and then she went to the Bible and showed you the scriptures, how, you know, and, and I had my little calculator. <laughs> that was the first time ever, your phone, you could do everything on it. So I calculated, and it did come up to uh, 1656. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and we've gone through it before, but it's like, wow, it's in the Bible, and it's right here on this tabernacle pattern. Yahweh, when he puts things together, they're tight. Now, I know I had a... <laughs> okay, 
What, what do we got? Uh-huh. Let's, let's do the panoramic vision first. All right, panoramic vision, mm -hmm. page five. Okay. Yahweh Elohim foreknew, planned oh. in advance okay, each hang detail on. of the universe. I'm going to stop you a little bit. Go ahead and read that again. Right. Okay. Yahweh Elohim Yahweh foreknew. Yahweh Elohim foreknew, or he knew ahead of time. Read. Planned in advance. Planned in advance. Now, I plan my week sometimes in advance, but it don't always work out the way I want to. The weather could stop it. A uh, flat tire could stop it. Anything can stop my plans. But for the most part, for people that are organized and try to be a little bit successful on this earth plane, will plan out their day or plan out their week. If you don't plan, you're just subject to anything. So it's better to make a plan. Sometimes you can fulfill that plan. Sometimes things get in the way, but you still basically have a track to run on. Read. Planned in advance each detail of the universe. Okay, he planned in advance each detail of the universe. Now that's Yahweh Elohim making the plan, so it's gonna, his will is gonna be carried out. Read. Even to the finite meanderings. Now listen to this. Even to the finite meanderings. I don't even know what that means. George, can you get that on your little computer thing for me? I'm so glad he's got the electronic dictionary so we don't have to flip back and forth. Um, so go ahead and read a little bit more. Even to the finite meanderings of the mind of man in search of happiness. In the minds of man in search of happiness. And really, isn't that what we all are here for in search of happiness? Um, I was just listening to something on the radio and, and um, they were talking about how, um, about g getting to heaven or going to heaven. And, and I thought, wow, isn't that something? Man is always trying to think out, think about what's going to benefit him. <laughs> you know, you got it, George. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, just say it, and then he'll repeat it in the mic. To follow a winding or intricate course. To find. To follow a winding or intricate course. Okay. To to wander aimlessly or casually without urgent destination. To, yeah, to wander aimlessly or casually without urgent, urgent, destination. urgent destination. Okay. That's it. So meandering, I guess, the meanderings of the thoughts of man. Hey, I'm not real clear. Okay, go ahead. Wandering. Wandering. Go ahead and finish reading in there a little bit more. But By this intangible pattern was the first physical tabernacle built in the wilderness. Okay, by this intangible tabernacle. And we have this tabernacle up here, and a lot of times we think it's physical, but it was an intangible tabernacle because Moses was having a vision of Yahweh. This tabernacle. So it was in Moses' mind at that point. They had not come down and physically built what Moses had seen up here in this wilderness, or in this mountain. Read. <clears throat> Which symbolically prophesied every major event in the history of the world. Okay, read that again, because that's a mouthful. Okay, by this intangible pattern was the first physical tabernacle built in the wilderness, uh -huh. which symbolically prophesied every major event in the history of the world. It prophesied, and I'm cutting it up, every, every major, major event, event in the, the history, history of, of the, the world. world. Now you think about that. When Dr. Kinley had this vision and revelation of, that Yahweh Elohim gave to him, he was able to predict things that we thought were predicted, but Yahweh had already planned it out, and he just allowed him to see it so that he could tell people. So it was already there to, um, 
it was an, an event that was going to happen anyway. But this tabernacle pattern, and, and I mean, he talked about how you can take this tabernacle pattern, it's in our moderation, absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. It's just that simple. Read. I shouldn't say simple. If you understand the ta tabernacle pattern, you understand something about Yahweh Elohim, you can understand his purpose and, and his plan and how he put things in order. Not that we came up with it or Dr. Kinley came up with an idea or that he's a psychic or he can look into the, it's not like that. Everything goes according to this tabernacle pattern. If you understand Yahweh Elohim, then you can understand the events that are going to unfold because it's his story and you're telling his story, not your story and taking $5 for reading somebody's, predicting somebody's future, come on. Is there, just read a little more. From the same pattern, the writer has evolved the philosophical measuring rod, which uh, can be applied to events. A philosophical, philosophical measuring rod. Measuring rod. And, and you can measure everything by this tabernacle. Go ahead. Uh, which can be applied to events to occur with the same unerring accuracy as did the prophets predict now the events? With, with unerring accuracy. I don't think any psychic has unerring accuracy. Even Sylvia Brown, which is supposed to be the best, she'll tell you, I, I miss sometimes, you know, I can't get it all the time. It just don't come like that, all right? <clears throat> So, sometimes um, man, most of man, period, cannot predict with accuracy. But if you are the creator of the universe, and you know, I find this tabernacle pattern simply amazing because what it does is it takes everything in the whole universe or all the events of man and it puts it in an order so that you can follow it along and understand something about Yahshua the Messiah. For instance, when you look at this tabernacle pattern <clears throat> and you have blood, water, spirit, 40, death, burial, resurrection, and you put it on Adam and you can see the blood you can see the water from the sweat on his face, blood, water. The spirit from Michael, angel, who was an angel who took him out of, uh, drove him out of the garden. And the 40 comes because this came from Moses' vision when he was in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. Then you go to the next plate, which we've been talking about a lot, is this flood and the end of an age. Noah preached and he put the blood on their heads. There was water from the flood. There was a spirit. See, this angel is even telling Noah how to build the ark. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. You can go story after story after story. We knew that there was something great or special about the Bible. But when you take this tabernacle pattern and you can see the same principles happening over and over. It's like the thread that sews it all together and makes it so that in simplicity, you can see how everything is tied together. And not only that, it all still points to one thing, Yahshua the Messiah. Nobody has ever been able to do that with the Bible, to take... Um, this take it from its utter simplicity and repetition to show forth Yahshua the Messiah. Nobody's ever been able to do that. So it, that lets you know this had to be a divine vision and revelation. Okay, Mr. McNamara, let's get fulfill in the dictionary. <laughs> fulfill. Fulfill. To bring into actuality. Okay, now fulfill means to bring into actuality. Read. 
to effect. To. Effect. To. To carry out. To carry out. Uh, an example would be an order or duty. An order or duty. Or uh, the sergeant says, okay, platoon, let's move from A, point A to point B. You carried out the order that they gave you. Read. Three, to measure up to or satisfy. To measure up to, or what was the other one? Satisfy. Satisfy. Now I know um, this is what they call Thanksgiving, and we have so much to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. And it's funny to me that it's surrounded around uh, uh, food. <laughs> And after I eat, I am usually so satisfied. That is one of the best things that I love to do in life is to eat and be satisfied. And you know, there's a difference in eating and, and not being satisfied because you can eat. And I know we went on a, a trip together and uh, I think I got food poisoning and I ate, but I wasn't happy for the rest of the night. So it's, it, when you can eat and be satisfied, that is a beautiful thing. When you eat from this spiritual food, you can be satisfied, and that's a beautiful thing. Your stomach's not all upset, and you know you have to take special stuff to get stomach get to rumbling and hurting and all that kind of stuff. That's not good. Okay, read. And this does have to do with the Ashram Messiah, by the way. <laughs> go ahead. Four, to go to the end of. To go to the end of. Read. Finish this. or complete. All right. To go to the end of. Finish or complete. Now, let's get fulfilled in the Bible. Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Mm -hmm. Think not. Okay. Now, he said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, this is Yahshua speaking, and he says, Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, the law and the prophets is what is called the Old Testament of people's Bibles. The law and the testimony. Read. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, he said, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now, it's just like, if I was about to go on trial, they done accused me of something again, but I got two witnesses. So am I going to take those two witnesses and, and drown them, put a hit out on them, get rid of them, ha make them get in an accident, fall off a cliff? No. He said, I am not come to destroy the law or the prophets, read, but to fulfill, but he came to fulfill. So there's a difference in destroying and fulfilling. There's a, and, and he just read the definition. It means to end, complete, satisfy, measure up to. So when Yahshua the Messiah came in, he came in to fulfill or like it said, finish, complete, satisfy. It says Old Testament is fulfilled. A lot of people think that that means that the Old Testament is just starting or that you still have something to do back in the Old Testament, that you, he wants you to keep feast and, and do something. Guess what? Like, and it, it really struck me when she said, we are finite. It's like we are so small. It just amazes me that we can think anything of ourselves at all. Because there was a, a, a picture, an email that came around, and it showed the earth. <laughs> and then the earth compared to the sun because the earth was going around the sun in the solar system. And then it showed the Milky Way, I think it was, in, or the universe, the Milky Way, and then that the Milky Way is a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And then that's not the only galaxy. There's other galaxies. 
So in the scheme of things, first of all, we're floating around in the middle of space nowhere on a rock. That's, that's what's happening. And then we have the nerve to be not even a speck. If, <laughs> if you zoom out, you know how you can zoom out on stuff, you would not be able to even detect us. Not just, we're talking about one little physical body, but then it gets to the point, you know, as you zoom out, you, cities have these big lights, you can't even detect the cities. You go far enough, zoom out. So we are so finite, so small. But the beauty of that is, is that even though we are so microscopic, as to almost appear to be absolutely nothing, Yahweh chose to come down to our level, to die, hang out with his creatures, and this is what they do to him. They crucify him. But he does it for them. <laughs> These little minuscule little things on the face of the earth. So I say, what manner of love is that? What, ah, uh, what manner? And then it brings us to the nervous system. The nervous system consists of this brain. It consists of the cord, and then it consists of the peripheral nerves. And these nerves go into every single part of the body. Now you look at a cell, and here we got a little cell over here. It's a different one. It's, it's an egg cell. But the egg itself, where is it? Oh, yeah, it says cell, C-E-L-L. -L. <laughs> and uh, how small a cell is that we can't even see it. Cells die on our body every single day. That's why we have to take a shower all the time because it's continually dying. The rest of the body doesn't even notice that the cell is dead. But with this brain, the control center of the whole body, what it does is it send, sends messages down to the body. It controls everything down to the cell down to the cellular level. So that even though when you compare a cell to the rest of the body, the cell is almost like nothing. But if you look at the cell itself, you see it has, it has, it's, it goes by the pat pattern, because this mitochondria, that's like the powerhouse of the cell. And that's what heats everything up. Each little cell has its own little powerhouse of energy, I guess is the word that you could use, energy in that cell that keeps it alive or keeps it going. And there's a lot of stuff going on in that cell, but that cell is so tiny. You need a microscope, and, and I'm pretty sure it took them years of study to even figure out what was going on inside the cell compared to your physical body. And, and when you, you look at your physical body, it's, it, you can look at it as Yahweh Elohim, him being the head here as in control. Even your body testifies to, to Yahweh and his purpose. It controls everything. A lot of things it controls before you even know something is going on with you. It sends, uh-oh, um, she ate that bad stuff. And where, where did we go? I don't want to say the place. It was, <laughs> the hospital's a horrible place to be. Oh, I didn't say that. You don't want them to get you. They'll get you. Um, but <laughs> your brain cover controls everything in your body. So when you ate that bad piece of food, your body is already sending stuff down there, trying to neutralize, sending acids, whatever it has to do to help you survive. So, and then it gets to the point to where it tells you, okay, <laughs> you need to get rid of that, whatever that is you ate. So you go to the bathroom, you're like, ah, ah. <laughs> and if it goes down further past where it's supposed to go, you're like, 
on the seat. Mm -mm. So it's coming out of both ends. You got to get rid of whatever that poison was that you put in your body. But you didn't know, you didn't see that um, salmonella poisoning that was on the food that you ate. How did you know? You didn't know. But the control center is going, sending messages, getting things, you start sweating. <laughs> All kinds of things happen. But it's to save the body. And isn't it amazing? And that's why we can just be so thankful um, in the scheme of all of this, in the scheme of everything, that Yahweh had enough love that he would come down and die that we might live. It's just a beautiful, beautiful story. So, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's go back to where you were reading. <laughs> For, ver for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay. Now, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until everything is fulfilled. And that was his job. His job was to come in to fulfill the things that were written in the law so that we didn't have to do it. Now, we talk about that just like it's every day, yeah, why wouldn't would anybody want to do all the stuff that was contained in the law? When you start reading about all the things they had to do, why would anybody want to keep that burden? Well, Satan, Beelzebub, has people thinking in their minds that they have to work out their own salvation. Mm -hmm. You look down at a cell, that cell is doing its operations that it needs to do, but it's still the brain that's directing it and having it operate the way it operates in order for the body to continue to live. So it has, it, when you just stop and think of what Yahweh has done to help us. And then he even came down and he allowed Dr. Kinley to have a vision so that we didn't have to be wandering around aimlessly, not knowing anything, but that we can be the sons or the children of Yahweh Elohim with understanding. He has given us that light, that life, that understanding of him. And, you know, they talk about, um, you know, children and their fathers and all this kind of stuff. And it's good for a child to know his, their father and know where they came from. Um, and that's what Yahweh has allowed us. He has allowed us to know him, know something about his business, his purpose, his pattern, his plan, his salvation for us. Because like she said, this is, this is not our home. This is just... Um, I call it training. This is boot camp. <laughs> That's what it feels like sometimes, boot camp. But we do have another home that we can go to. And um, I just want to just say I really appreciate Yahshua. <laughs> and I appreciate him in the brethren, too. Sometimes y'all just don't know. He gives you things to say to, to help us, to help each other. So... Um, well, let's keep lifting each other up and praising Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. That brings a close to our class for this evening. Are there any comments or questions? Enjoy class. Enjoy class. Class announcements are as follows. Classes are held every Wednesday and Friday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And Sundays, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. All beginner and instructional meetings are posted on the whiteboard in the back. This coming Sunday at 9 a.m. is our first fundamentals class for, the, is that right? Yeah. Coming up for the month of December. 
Um, a reminder that the school is supported by our members. Pledges are due at the begin beginning of each month. Donations are welcomed and greatly appreciated. For either one, please see our treasurer. From the Office of the Public Relations, we you can now find us on Ustream, YouTube, Facebook, and at our website, lansingbible.weebly.com. All direct donations for the Ustream project are greatly appreciated. Well, we ask that you please do not enter the room during the scripture reading, prayer, or moderation. And we ask that you please keep all food and drink other than water confined to the lobby area to help keep the classroom neat and clean. I um, feel like I'm missing something. Class change. Yep, class change. Yeah, if you got change, leave it for the class. No. Um, <laughs> Um, the next uh, couple holidays coming up there in the December and January are both on Wednesdays. And so class will be moved to 1 o'clock. Is that what it was? 11. 11 to 1 on those two days, December 25th and January 1st, just to let you know. Um, there are a couple events coming up. Chicago. What is the only name for salvation? And that is April 4th through April 6th of 2014. Vanderkamp also is having an event August 19th through August 24th of 2014. That concludes our announcements for today. Let us all rise for the doxology so that we may be dismissed. I will be quoting the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Alleluia. You can see it in the wings of a bird flying free. You can see it in a flower as it reaches for the sky. Every ocean praises Yahweh in overwhelming signs. So let's sing hallelujah. Let's sing hallelujah. Let's sing hallelujah. Let's sing. Let's sing. Hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing. His creation is a masterpiece no artist could touch. Oh, no, no. The color that he painted, he painted it with love. His signature is seen on everything he made. Even you, for every breath you breathe, you breathe his living name. So let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing. Come on.
it blows through the trees You can see it in the wings of a bird flying free You can see it in a flower as it reaches for the sky Every ocean praises Yahweh in overwhelming signs. So let's sing.